Today's Left podcast provides an in-depth insight into the working practices of the greats from those who were in close proximity when the magic was being made. For more episodes featuring musicians who've worked with the likes of Elvis Presley, The Beatles, Michael Jackson, Fleetwood Mac, Bob Dylan and Oasis, go to www.thestageleftpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at The Stage Left Pod or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Stage Left Podcast. Today we've a man who's perhaps had the greatest vantage point of some of the most creative geniuses in Western music in the past 50 years. Our guest today has played an integral role as producer, composer and multi-instrumentalist on a jaw-dropping list of groundbreaking David Bowie albums, including Space Oddity, The Man Who Sold the World and The Berlin Trilogy, and was centric to the creation of the iconic sound of T-Rex. As well as this, he's worked closely with a huge list of esteemed artists, including Paul McCartney, U2, Thin Lizzy, Iggy Pop, Morrissey and The Manic Street Preachers, as well as many, many more. Today we'll be talking Bowie, Bolan, Blackstar, touring and innovative recording techniques. So it's a pleasure to say our guest on the Stage Left podcast today is the Grammy winning producer Tony Visconti. Thanks for joining us today, Tony. How's it going? Fine. Thank you, Chris. That was a great introduction. Thanks. <laughs> great. OK, so um, I got in touch with you in October and um, you asked me if we could record this around January time because you had something to talk about. Um, little did I know that you had uh, uh, you were working secretly on a new Bowie album. Um, how's right. that been for you? How's that been? You must be excited now. Well, it's very exciting, so we could tell the news, but uh, it's re- it was really under strict control, the secrecy. And, uh, you know, we had to sign NDAs and all that, but wow, the, the dam has broken loose, and all will be revealed on January 8th, when you actually can hear the full album. So it is a very exciting time. Great. And um, what's the reason for the secrecy? Because I know you did it for the previous album as well. Is it just for the kind of surprise element? Or is it, you know, how comes that it's such kind of been um, kept secret and, and wrapped in cotton wool? Well, uh, a lot of people are doing that. We're not the only ones doing that. It's, it's a matter of like professional uh, secrecy because we don't want people to know that we're making an album. There are spies everywhere, and if people got an inkling that we were doing that, they would somehow pay off the right person and get a rough mix or something like that. The other reason is that I think David uh, likes to not to have that pressure on him. If he announced that he was making an album, he, I think he would personally feel too much pressure. So we announced that we have an album when, when we know we have an album. We know it's finished, you know, not before. Um, so I've heard a couple of songs off it. Uh, Lazarus and Black Star have both been released, I think. Um, both very compelling listens. Black Star is a, a ten-minute masterpiece for who haven't heard it yet. A constantly evolving piece of music, going in subtle different directions. Um, I wonder if you could tell us about recording that one and, and how that song came about. That song was actually one of the first songs we recorded uh, during the. Uh, we, we did the, we did three separate sessions. Uh, one in uh, January, February, and March. Black Star was in the first group of sessions, and um, it wasn't. Uh, I, I had heard some of the songs that we were going to record, but Black Star was written at the very end of David's uh, demos, when making of his own demos. So when he brought it to the studio, it was a complete surprise to me too. I hadn't heard it before. It's a ten-minute song. We had to record it in two sections, and uh, I think section two was done the following day. So. It was quite an elaborate production, as, as you, you can guess from hearing it. Yeah, so it's, it's an amazing song. Um, and the drums are really interesting on it. Um, who's playing drums on this record? A wonderful, genius drummer called Mark Juliana. He's from uh, Queens in uh, New York City. And uh, he's, only, he's only in his 30s. But you can tell he grew up, he's, a, he's not only an accomplished jazz player, but he's, he's listened to hip-hop. And obviously, he's listened to David Bowie when he was growing up, too. And what was the decision to uh, get a new band in and, and new people? Was it a fresh start, or was it just to get a, a different angle from them? Well, David traditionally does this. Uh, I haven't produced all his albums, and I might only learn at the last minute that I'm not going to produce the new one. And I, I, But, I mean, that happened years ago, and I've learned to accept that, that he needs to do this. He needs to just change the, uh, the, the, you know, regroup, even if it's in his own mind. But, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with the band that played on the next day. They're my friends and they're great musicians. But this was a wonderful, adventurous step forward. And he did want to make an album that had jazz uh, kind of roots in it. Uh, he and I both loved jazz since we were teenagers. We discussed this the day I met him, you know, in uh, 19, I think, 68 or 67, that we were both jazz fans. 
and we had this in the back of our minds all, all this time. We finally found the right people to make the record with. Because you played the tuba at a young age, and I believe he played the saxophone, is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's great that it's gone full circle, and it's kind of, you, you're going down the jazz route on this one. Um, you, in the past, you've spoken about the importance of pre-production meetings, uh, as they allow you to, in your own words, cook up a recipe. Um, what were the result of the meetings for, for Black Star? Um, and, you know, what was the blueprint for this album? What did you want to do or avoid doing on this album? Well, again, we wanted to go for a fresh sound, and we had an experimental recording session uh, early in uh, 2014 with uh, David's, uh, another drummer who plays with David, Zach Alford. And uh, I brought along a keyboard, uh, a jazz pianist friend of mine, Jack Spann, whom I met recently uh, at the time, and I, myself on bass. So that was when the pre-production began. We, we knocked out about... Uh, Six, six songs in about a week, but maybe five days. And a lot of those, uh, almost all of them, made the Black Star album. Uh, so the, the band learned our demos. Don, Donnie McCaslin's band heard our demos. And uh, if they didn't make the Black Star album, they made the musical Lazarus. So I, I really believe all six songs were used. A couple of the songs were put on the compilation album last year, is that right? So... Sue or Season in Crime and... Uh, tis, a, tis a Pity She Was a Whore, yeah. That's, that's right. But, but these are, you know, very different versions. Oh, she re-recorded them, right, so they're new, yeah. new versions. Great, okay. And tell us a bit about the songs we might not have heard. So Girl Loves Me, Dollar Days, I, I Can't Give Everything Away. Can you tell us a bit about those? Because no one's heard them yet. Well, Girl Loves Me is a, a real great rock song. It's a slow, slamming rock song. And uh, there's uh, he's actually written a special language for that song. The lyrics are quite amazing. But roughly based on the, uh, I, I forget what it's called, but the, the language in um, Clockwork Orange. Oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. he's, used, he's borrowed some words from that, and he's borrowed some words from the old uh, Soho dialect called Polari. Right. Uh, I think, uh, you know, and I'm a Yank, and I know all these things, <laughs> which is quite amazing. But 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 the way he, he weaves a story about Girl love in Girl Loves Me. That's just, it's almost science fiction. It's so amazing. I think everyone will love that track. Can't wait to hear it. Um, and how does being in the studio with David now differ to, to when you first started working with him? Uh, it hasn't changed one bit. He's the same person. He's uh, Every time I look at him, I see the uh, 19-year-old guy that I met in, uh, so in uh, on the West End in London. He's the same person. Uh, he, he doesn't... Well, you know, he's really got a good attitude in the studio where other people might be very nervous and worry and all that. He, he's always been gracious and easygoing. I mean, he puts everyone else at ease. He's probably the most relaxed person in the studio. I might be biting my nails, worrying about the microphones and the setup and all kinds of details and all that. But he really is very relaxed, very calming. He's very, got a very calming effect. And the other thing about him is he was, he's such a great singer, and he was a great singer when I met him years and years ago, that when he gets up the mic, in front of the mic, he only sings the song about two or three times. He, he doesn't do like 25 takes like other people do. He's so good. You know, he, the, the first time is usually great. And then uh, when he sings it the second and third time, it's sheer luxury for me. Great. That's, that's a fantastic insight. And what could a young musician specifically learn from David Bowie? that they wouldn't learn from other artists, um, having worked with him so closely? Well, one thing David does is that he's always looking to the future. And I, I think a lot of young musicians try to recreate the past. Uh, you know, they want to, like rock, for instance, is pretty stale right now. It has been for a long time because people still want to make a, a rock and roll record based in the 70s. Uh, I don't know, they want to imitate Mark Bolin or Thin Lizzy, you know, other people that were, and that's all well and good, but but that is a, like, that, that, is, that has been crystallized, that style. You have to bust outside of the boundaries, do something new and original. And my, my formula is, if you want to make music that people, um, you want to grab people's attention, you have to mix it with 50% of what's been and 50% new creation out of your head. This way, you know, if it's a hundred, I mean, some people are so far out, they, they, they can come up with something that sounds like it was recorded on the planet Mars, you know, <laughs> by Martians. That's not going to sell. 
you got to have half Martian, half Earthling. That's my that's my formula. Love it. And um, actually, that's an interesting point because. Have you found yourself in the past where you've had pressures from, say, record companies or people with commercial interests uh, in an album and you kind of working with someone who's really, really artistic and ex experimental like Bowie? Um, how, how have you dealt with that situation or what advice would you give to producers in that situation? Well, I used to get that a lot. and um, But in the 70s, it was a real different situation, Chris. It, in the 70s, you didn't get signed unless you were far out. You know, they, they were actually looking for people who had something fresh and new, and that was certainly the name of the game. And we've got the Beatles to thank for that, because every time the Beatles made a new album, say from Rubber Soul to Revolver and all that, it was radically different, and you wouldn't com call it commercial at first. The only thing that makes a record commercial is not the sound of it. It's when people start buying it then it's commercial. And then the record labels take, they perk up and notice, oh, you like that? Oh, okay, we'll get, we'll get people who do that, whatever that new thing is, you know. So people are deceived that they feel uh, like, uh, till this day, record labels think if you have uh, the, the uh, chorus comes within 30 seconds of the intro and all this stuff, they think there's a formula. There is no formula for, for a hit record. There is absolutely no formula. And I've always lived by this rule and I don't listen to A&R people much. I think I only listen to A&R people who love the artist that they sign. And they really believe, they have faith in the artist, and they're going to go the distance. You know, uh, To expect a number one record right out of the box is unrealistic. It only happens once in a million times. So uh, I think we should just come to the everyone, the labels and myself, that we live in a musical culture here that really needs nurturing. And it needs new input all the time, fresh input, not the same old stale formulas. It's a great answer, thank you. Um, now, you've played uh, on lots of instruments on, on Bowie Records as well as composing string arrangements. Does it give you free reign over the parts that you play? Um, for instance, if you take, say, the string arrangement you did on 1984, that's very kind of integral to that song. Um, were you left to your own devices or were you kind of told by David, we want this and uh, under fixed uh, fixed idea? Well, his, he's great. Uh, that is, that's all my own writing. But he said before, he said, Tony, I want, uh, listen to Barry White, then then write those strings. So I said, you know, and I, I love the fact that David thinks I can do anything, but I never even tried that before. I never even wrote like that. So that's not even my generals, in, in my general style. But yeah, like for instance, on uh, the next day, uh, I did some string writing for that and if he has a particular line he, he might play it to me and then and he'll say you know now base the arrangement around that like uh, I think there was a on Heathen there was I would be your slave you know he gave me a few ideas for that but he know he trusts me and like Mark Boland Mark Boland used to trust me he'd just say Tony write some strings and that was it and mm -hmm. I would, I'd be off on my own and I you know t time and time again I've proved that I, I do something that they like so I do get free reign yes Let's talk about you as a bass player, because I think sometimes with all your other achievements, your bass playing goes under the radar a bit. Um, and, I mean, I was listening to Man Who Sold the World. I mean, your, your, your bass playing on that is absolutely incredible, particularly on the verses. And um, What do you remember writing about writing that part uh, and recording bass on that song or, or, or that particular album? Well, that, that album is my calling card as a bass player. I mean, I, I, people do, do respect me for, for that bass playing, and I respect Mick Ronson for coaching me. I didn't play bass like that. Mick Ronson said, if you're going to play bass like on this album, he goes, you have to listen to Jack Bruce. And uh, he sat me down and played me cream. I mean, I was already, uh, I knew what Jack Bruce sounded like, but I never studied him. And uh, basically it's lead bass playing, you know, mm. playing lead on a lot of those songs. And uh, now that I've been rehearsing every day before the tour that's coming up, I mean, my, my fingers are really, I'm, I'm flying around like a lead guitarist, and I, I laugh all the time, because if it wasn't for Mick Ronson, I wouldn't be doing that. But yeah, I do I do, do get asked to play bass a lot. I play on almost every production I, I record. I'm, I'm, I pick up a bass and play at least on one track or something like that. And that's something I, I'm glad I kept my hand in over the years, because it keeps me fit, keeps me young up here. And, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, acknowledging that. So you're going on tour soon um, with Holy Holy. To, is it to play that album in full? Is that right? 
Yes. Uh, when we recorded The Man Who Sold the World, we thought it was the greatest album ever, ever recorded. Mick, Woody, David, and myself, we loved it. And then to, at the end of the album, uh, we split up because uh, David had advice from his new manager. He said, uh, fire the band. You don't need the band. You're, you're going to be a big star. We'll get a band for you and all that. Which is ironic because uh, a year later, Woody and Mick Ronson rejoined David to make Hunky Dory. And eventually they got their mate, Trevor Boulder, to replace me uh, in, in the hype and become the Spiders from Mars. But the fact is... I forgot about that incident entirely until Woody Woodmansey reminded me, and he said, "You know, Tony says we never played this album live." And he was right. You know, we never toured, we never played it live, and I, I thought, "Wow, this is one of the best things I've ever done on bass." And I think it's one of my best productions as well. You know, even though it was very early years for me, so I jumped at it. I mean, not at first because I knew I'd have to start practicing again, and though I, I call those that bass playing is very muscular. <laughs> you not only have to remember the parts, you have to be fit, very fit yeah. to play that. Yeah. So I'm fit, I'm fit again, you know, and uh, thanks to Woody. So um, I think this is going to be great because a lot of fans love this album. It's one of David's darkest albums he, he's ever written. It's right It's right up there with, with Outside and Earthling and all that. This is, there's very little humor on The Man Who Sold the World. It's, it's a, and it's some fantastic lyrics uh, and the playing is, is, is absolutely great. And I, I have to tell you, it sounds, we sound great, you know, it, because we busked a lot of that in the studio. We, we wrote Black Country Rock in the studio. Mm. It, it wasn't pre-written. And maybe one or two other songs uh, were like that. So now that we've had years to rehearse and to think about it and play, those, those songs have developed a bit. Although we stick very close to the originals. They, they sound better, in my opinion. I wish we had David Bowie up on the stage with us, but uh, we're not getting him. So we have Glenn Gregory, who I think is so wonderful. He's brought something new to it. You know, we, we play the, this, the whole album a little lower in key to accommodate uh, uh, Glenn's gr big frame and big baritone voice, and it, it sounds even darker and heavier. So the fans love it. We, we weren't sure at first. But after our first gig, we knew we had approval for Glenn. And do you get the uh, do you get the rock recorder out? No, I can't do both at the same time. But of course, my daughter, is, my daughter is on stage with us. She's playing rock recorder. Oh, nice one! Oh, that's that's we, good. We're keep, keeping it in the family. That's it. I, I love it. Um, okay, and you're playing. Uh, we'll come to this at the end. But you're 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 playing a number of dates in America and one in Canada. Is that right? Coming in. Uh, yeah, we're playing eleven dates in all. One in Canada, one in Toronto, and uh, it's a feel field tour we're trying to feel if we 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 have uh fans enough fans in america to pull this off i know we have a lot of fans in the uk and rightly so but uh we've been getting letters from all kinds of american bowie fans when are we going to see this thing in america so we're trying it out on the east coast ticket sales look very good and if they if they um are really great sales then we'll take it to the east coast and you know america is a very big country it's 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 a very very expensive and it's a very long journey. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds sounds brilliant. Um, so of course I must ask you about um uh, Berlin. Um, Bowie said of Berlin when you were you were living there, um, that it was a city cut off from its world, its art and culture. It was dying with no hope of retribution, and that's the time that you recorded uh, Heroes, of course. Um, it must be somewhat surreal when you hear that song, because, of course, David Bowie was looking out the studio window on a break in recording when he saw you by the Berlin Wall embraced in a kiss, um, which inspired the final verse of the song. And tell us your fondest memories of recording that song. Well, uh, Heroes was recorded about two weeks earlier than when he wrote the lyrics. We just had this song in the key of D, uh, we, it, it sounded lovely. It was long and meandering because we never knew when to stop. So the, the version that I think it, I think you have almost every note on the album version. It got close to seven minutes, and we still didn't really understand what uh, where the verses were, where the choruses were. So we kept overdubbing on it. Robert Fripp came in and did all the beautiful uh, Ebo feedback. Well, it sounds like Ebo, but it, he did it with just feedback, all the, his high guitar parts. And we still didn't know what, where the verses and choruses were. It had no lyric, no melody. And uh, so of, of all the songs on the album, that's the one I am most fond of. 
Because obviously, as you just said, I, uh, uh, one of my uh, surreptitious uh, actions made it into the lyrics, you know, and I was told so yes. when I came, came back from that walk. So it's quite an epic. That song. And it was you who put Robert Fritz's uh, three parts together, is that right? So he recorded three different guitar parts and you put them all together, is that right? Well, the reason for that was he, he, like the rest of us, he wasn't sure what he was playing on the song. Like, uh, do I play this now or that? So I had to take his three parts, and uh, we didn't we didn't have Pro Tools in those days. But so with faders, I had to select the best bits. You, you don't hear all three at once all the time. Probably most of the time, you hear only two two of them together. But then I would bring the third one in when it was appropriate, and uh, it was like painting a picture with his three separate guitar parts. And I did all that, still not knowing what the song was about. And you play tambourine on that, is that right? Is that your tambourine that comes in on the final verse about the lyrics about you? Yes, yes. And David plays the thing that sounds like a cowbell, only it's a, it's the, a reel of tape with no tape on it. And he just bangs it <laughs> with a, a drumstick. So I'm on tambourine and David's on tape reel. In regards to innovative recording techniques, um, one example I wonder if you could share with us is how you achieved the string choir effect on the pre-chorus to Ashes to Ashes. I think you recorded it using a, a four-story staircase, is that right? And <clears throat> That's right. The uh, guitarist we used, Chuck Hammer, had one of the first guitar synthesizers. And uh, you must have, now it's commonplace, but you can imagine David's astonishment and mine astonishment when Chuck Hammer strummed his guitar and out came a string section. I mean, it was totally science fiction. This is like 1979. And, uh, but it sounded a bit synthy, you know, and, mm. and uh, it, it sounded like even though the sound was coming out of a guitar, it could have come off a keyboard. And, you know, string sound technology still wasn't great in the 70s. And we wanted to make it bigger somehow. And our engineer, Larry Alexander, said, what, you know, why don't we put it in the stairwell? We have this four-story stairwell. I could put some microphones downstairs, microphones upstairs, and that's how we got to make those the guitar synth sound so spacious. So a lot of trickery went into that, but it, in the end, it was okay. totally worth it. And the piano sound you get on the intro and the outro is so so unusual. How did you achieve that? Well, for years I've been an early user of. Um, uh, even tie products, and I use the harmonizer for uh, the drum sound on low, the snare drum sound, which everyone couldn't figure out how that was done because I had the only harmonizer in the UK, <laughs> and that's how I did it. But there's another thing they, that that company makes wonderful special effects, and they were really early in the game with special effects. So what we were doing, what we tried to do is we tried to get a stereo uh, Fender Rhodes piano to make that sound, but the studio Fender Rhodes was broken, and there, so that was it. We couldn't wait for the hire, the instrument hire, to bring one. So I said, let uh, the keyboard player, I said, let him, uh, keyboard player from Bruce Springsteen's band, I said, let him play that on the piano, real old-fashioned piano. I'm going to put it through an instant flanger, and I know a, a stereo trick we could do with this. So I, I put it on extreme settings, and uh, the pianist played and uh, we finally got it it took about 10 20 minutes to get that sound but once we got the sound we knew we were onto something brand new who needed the uh, fender Rhodes piano this was way better than the fender Rhodes piano it sounds absolutely great and it's very very iconic sound as well um so you obviously have a very strong relationship with david um uh, and i know he was there for you during difficult times in your life pre-scary monsters um, and i know that you had a close relationship with phil lineup from uh, thin lizzie as well um can you talk about any difficulties that might arise that you've had as producer when you've got close relationships in regards to compartmentalizing the friendship and the professional duties when it comes to decision making in the studio? Well, that that's that is a, a thin line to walk, and you know I have to give David his due. He is not only a good friend, but he's a great professional co colleague as well. And that line between friendship and colleague is very very blurred between us. I've, you know, I could eat lunch with him. I could. I even went on holidays with him years ago, and we uh, we went on a little skiing holiday at his invitation. But not so much with, like, Phil Linett was a different problem. Uh, I loved the guy, and I socialized with him. But, you know, I've said it in my book, and, I, and I'm, I don't mind saying it again. I know it hurt some people's feelings, but 
he would his drug use was out of control, and uh, it was hard to. You know, I like to I like people to have a, a glass or two of wine when they sing, but because uh, it relaxes them. Every every opera singer does that. You know, it's, it's okay. You know, if you're nervous and all that. But what we were getting during the Thin Lizzy sessions were actually like a, a drinking club party. You know, a gentleman's drinking club. And uh, if I didn't get a good take of them by about five o'clock in the afternoon, it was over by after five p.m. It was just it just turned into a party every night. So that was a difficult relationship to juggle. Nevertheless, Chris, I made it work. I told the managers, uh, and uh, we we got a little more discipline towards the end. It, <laughs> but it happened in every in the, in the album. But you know, it had to be said. These things have to be said. Fantastic. Um, okay, um, let's talk Bolan. Um, I've just literally finished reading your book, book this afternoon. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, you talk about your relationship with him in great detail, so uh, people should really uh, have a look out for your book. Um, what do you remember of the, the early hype session? So in the hype, it was yourself, um, Bowie and Bolan all in the same band. Is that right? Um, what do you remember of them kind of, I think they came over to your house in Earl's Court and were kind of jamming together as the three of you. What do you remember of those early sessions? Oh, that, that wasn't hype. That was oh, sorry. a couple of years before hype. Okay. You know, hype was Woody and uh, Nick and myself. Nick right. Ronson and myself. But in the early days, I had met David and Mark in the same month. I think I met Mark before I met David. Yes, I did meet Mark before I met David. And um, I had a, a flat in Earl's Court, and I was like their big American cousin. They were still living with their moms, dads. <laughs> and uh, after... Uh, Mark moved out of his mom's house. He got a little flat in Notting Hill Gate, and they, they had to share, he and June Bolin had to share a bathroom in the corridor of, you know, with other tenants in the building. They, they were really, we were all poor. So they used to come to my house for not only to jam and play on guitars, they came to my house to have a bath every week. Once a week there was a bath, bath night. Mark and June, <laughs> I think David had a bath at his, his parents' house, so he, he didn't have to come to me. But uh, the jam sessions were great. Uh, I didn't have enough tape in those days to keep it running. Every now and then I did. I mean, I recorded Mark and Steve Peregrine took on my, my little tape recorder. But being poor at the time meant you couldn't buy uh, tape. A lot of things you couldn't buy. Food, tape. You know, sometimes it was you know, food, tape. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> but we had some great times. I had two electric guitars, my electric bass. Mark and, and David would pick up electric guitars, and I would play my my Fender bass, and we jam for hours on end. Fantastic, great, great story, great story. And I know that you said that he was the most challenging person to produce on a psychological level. Um, as I say, it's all in your book. But um, wonder what experience you would pass on to young musicians working with big personalities for the first time, and uh, you know what advice would you give to them in that situation? Well, if you're wor working with someone who feels the need to be rude and dominate, you know, be domineering and, uh, and consider it and all that, you have to weigh, uh, it's, you, you have to weigh, the, you have to balance in your mind, is this worth it to, to put up with this? And in every case that I have put up with a very difficult personality, and I, and there are more people than Mark Bolin that I've had to work with, the truth is they are the star. Their name is going to be very big on the record album, on the sleeve and all that. Uh, that, that the fans love them. They, they really don't care about the record producer and the engineering staff. And it's something, you know, like Hollywood stars to do the same thing to the director. And, and uh, Some people just have to feel, they feel that they have to operate out of a, 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 a platform of meanness and, and uh, to put people in their place so that they can re remain. So I just put up with it and I become the, the better person for it. Yeah. That's the way I feel. I, we get the, We just have to get the job done make everybody happy. The star above all has to be happy. That's great advice. Okay, um, I know you've got a dash off, so we'll begin to wrap up. Um, I just wondered if um, you could uh, just answer the, the following questions for me. Um, what ambitions do you have left in the music industry, Tony? Well, I love what I do, and I want to continue to produce records. It's still a fascinating aspect of my life. I, I feel that every album I make, I get better at it. And I don't think I've made my best album yet. I, I, I make quite a few. I've made quite a few really good ones, I must admit. Uh, I do write. I, I have uh, an, uh, an album of my own music in the works at the moment. I don't know when I'm going to release that on the public, but it has just a little 
ways to go. I've been writing for about six years now, but I produce so many records, I don't have time to to really finesse them. Well, you said that you've always wanted to be, uh, you know, when you were young, you wanted to be a singer or at least in a band. Um, surely now's the time to, to get something out with your own name on it and, and you performing on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can sing and I can write and I play very well. And uh, sure, you know, it's just that I've dedicated my life to other people and quite rightly so, you know. I, I don't begrudge any one second of time I've spent with Mark Bolin or Phil Lynott or David Bowie. It was well worth it. I mean, I, I love and respect those people. You know, they, they, they're some of the, they are the greatest pop, pop icons of our, of our time, you know. And, uh, so it's not any, that time wasn't wasted. But now maybe it's my turn. Good stuff. And, and what fears do you have for the music industry and uh, how might they be addressed? Well, I think people in the music industry have become small-minded, they're terrified, they, they operate out of a place of fear, and as I said earlier, you have to realize that this is a culture we live in, it's not a business, it's a culture, you can make money from culture, uh, like Salvatore Dali, if he was told to paint every picture like the same as the, his last hit, he'd be out of business, and he would have been out of business in no time. If you, if you uh, sign a, a genius, you have to treat that person like a genius and not like a, a, a tin of beans. You know, it's not a commodity you put on the shelf in a supermarket. Mm -hmm. So to treat this culture that we live in with great respect and contribute to it, don't, don't uh, try to use it to make a quick buck. Great stuff. And um, so you're touring next week with Holy Holy, as you said, uh, in the States. Um, what do you think percentage likelihood will see David Bowie do the same? Well, he categorically told me around the time of the next day that he wasn't going to tour again. Mm. And he said, if anyone asks, tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm telling you. <laughs> Any particular, what, how comes he's fallen out of love uh, of going on tour? Has he kind of said that to you? It seems such a shame. Well, he, I, I think it's, he loves being on stage. It's just touring is exhausting. Uh, the, it, even if you're a, treated by first class uh, you know, first class accommodations and first class flights, hotels and all that, it's still exhausting. You're, you're waking up at ungodly hours, you're traveling through the night, uh, you pick up germs from hotels and all that. I think that's the part that nobody likes. And considering he's probably put on something like 10,000 shows in his lifetime, I think everyone's seen, seen him, you know, that needs to see him. They, I think now they just want to see him again, you know, and I don't blame them, but I, I that's the part I know he doesn't like about touring. Yeah, that's it's part, in my wish. This is just me talking, not him. I think he could uh, get one of those uh, cinema concerts where he's he's in one studio playing to an audience, say you know ten thousand people, and it would be broadcast all over the world. It would be recorded. You could you could download it and all that. Just one 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 concert. I'm sure. That's possible, but he hasn't mentioned that to me. I swear, my that's my own wish. You know, you, I would like that to happen. You got to mention it to him. Unfortunately, I, I wanted to see him in two thousand and three, but he's playing um, Wembley Arena, and Wembley Arena has the most awful acoustics for the uh, in the audience. So I thought oh, I'll wait until he plays again. And of course, he never toured afterwards. So unfortunately, I've never had a chance to see him. But hopefully, one day he, he might play again. Um, okay, well, I'll let, I'll let you go there because I know you have to dash off. Um, unfortunately, the sun machine is coming down, and we're going to have a party because it's we're recording this at five pm on New Year's Eve. Um, just want to say thanks for taking your time to be on the Stage Left podcast. You've had such an amazing career. We didn't even get on to Lou Reed or uh, Morrissey or Manic Street Preachers, John Squire, um, but maybe for another time. But um, just want to say what a great insight you've given us. Um, best of luck for the tour and the Bowie album launch. Um, have a great new year and keep up the good work. Thanks a lot, Chris. And, you know, there could be a part two down the line. If, uh, you know, but right, I've got so much preparation to do for the tour. Yeah. And uh, a, you know, I don't even want to start with you. Tell Nothing you what I have to do today. But anyway, Happy New Year to you too, Chris. And, Thanks. Uh, and anyone else who's in the UK who's listening to this. Great. Thanks very much, Tony. I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. For more episodes featuring musicians who've worked with the likes of Fleetwood Mac, Bob Dylan, The Beatles, Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley, The Prodigy, Oasis, go to www.thestageleftpodcast.com, follow us on Twitter at The Stage Left Pod, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Stage Left Podcast. See you next time.